Chapter 6, Probability. The learning outcomes or objectives for this chapter are as follows. Number one, we'll understand the definition of probability. If you ask someone what, what they think probability means, normally they'll respond with a, an answer of chance. What is the chance that something will occur? And we're going to use that basic understanding to um, implement inferential statistics. For example, we'll ask ourselves, what are the chances that this sample average would occur without treatment? Or what is the chance that this sample average would occur in the untreated population? We'll learn to explain assumptions of random sampling. We'll use the unit normal table to find probability. So this is the first chapter we'll, we will use one of the tables in the appendix and we'll um, have to learn the process of entering that table, which columns to read, and in fact I actually have a separate video dedicated simply to understanding the unit normal table in Appendix B. So once we learn how to use the unit normal table, we'll utilize it to find specific scores for a given population. We'll also utilize it to find percentiles or percentile rank of a normal distribution. So tools you will need to be successful with this chapter. An understanding of proportions. We understand that a proportion can be expressed as a fraction, decimal, or percentage. So we may see a fraction of one-fourth, and we know that that's the equivalent of a decimal of 0.25, and that's the same as saying something has a 25% chance of occurring. So we'll have to understand how we produce a fraction. Essentially, it's the part, part over the whole. The part over the whole. And again, recognizing that we simply tra translate that into decimal by taking the numerator and dividing it by the denominator. And then we can multiply that decimal by 100 to express it as a percentage. We'll also need basic algebra skills. Um, so in chapter five, we talked about z-scores and how we can move variables around to solve for a specific um, variable of interest. So we'll apply our basic algebra skills to this chapter, and we'll also utilize our understanding of a z-score and the equation. So we, we learned that z is equal to x minus the mu divided by standard deviation for working with a population, and z is equal to x minus m divided by s if we're working with a sample. And again, we learned that the z-score represents a precise location in relation to the mean of a population or a distribution expressed in standard deviation units. So again, the mean deviation distance from the mean divided by standard deviation units. So we look at how far a score is from the mean and then divide that deviation by this, what one standard deviation unit is equal to to express that location, right, in relation to the mean of a distribution. And this will be um, essential when we talk about probability. What is the chance that this score will occur? What is the probability of obtaining a score above a certain score, below a score, between two scores? So all of this information that we learned in Chapter 5 will be utilized in this chapter um, in relation to finding probability. So our introduction to probability includes the following information. So research begins with a question about an entire population. So again, we will state our research hypothesis. And we know that that is um, followed with the notation of H sub 1. And then we'll state our null hypothesis. And that's denoted as H sub 0. So we may hypothesize that the antidepressant drug will have an effect on depression. And the null hypothesis would negate that and state that the antidepressant drug 
will not have an effect on depression. So again, this research question or topic relates to the population. We want to treat or create a drug that can be applied to the population of individuals who suffer from depression. But the actual research is conducted using a sample. So we learned that it is um, unlikely to have access to all members of a population. So we use a subset of that population, a mini population that we refer to as a sample to conduct our research. And technically what we are testing is the null hypothesis. The null stating that nothing is happening, that the drug is, does not have an effect. And that's what we test, even though our interest lies in the research hypothesis that the drug will have an effect. But the test is always conducted on the null hypothesis using a sample. And now we're starting to engage in the process of, of using inferential statistics. The first part of the first four chapters of this course related to descriptive statistics, describing something by organizing data, presented in a graph, summarizing by stating the mean of a distribution, and supplementing that information with a standard deviation unit to illustrate the consistency or inconsistency of a distribution. And now we're moving into inferential statistics, which essentially means that we use sample information to draw conclusions about a population, or as it states here, inferential statistics use sample data to answer questions about the population. And that relates to the relationship between samples and populations are defined in terms of probability. In other words, when we treat a sample, those who get the antidepressant drug, we want to ask ourselves, what are the chances or the likelihood that that sample mean in terms of measuring episodes of depression, what are the chances that this sample mean that's been given the drug is reflective of the untreated population. In other words, how likely is that average to occur if we just look at the population of those who suffer from depression? The higher the likelihood, then that illustrates that the drug was ineffective. The lower the probability, it illustrates that that value is rare and um, giving us support for this idea that the drug was effective. So we'll learn more about those relationships as we go along when applied to a normal distribution. So again, here's a visual um, illustration of what we are now engaging in. So we begin with a question about the population here, and then we um, speak in terms of probability when we look at the sample and we draw conclusions about the population using inferential statistics um, to answer a particular research question. So essentially what we um, end up doing when we administer a treatment to the sample, we ask ourselves the, the following question. We ask, what are the chances that the sample results, and when I say results, let's say we're measuring the mean of that sample, would occur in the untreated population. So we want to think of the norm, a normal distribution normal distribution and we have the mean of the population. Now values, again we're going to move into the selection of a sample in chapter 7. In this chapter we're going to look at the um, likelihood of a score, an x value, but for inferential statistics to be applied it really relates to a sample and that's what chapter 7 is all about. But um, we'll begin with baby steps and just talk about the likelihood of a specific score. Nonetheless, if we were to take a sample from the population and the sample mean occurred in the center area, that means it has very high likelihood because of frequency. We understand the higher the peak, the more occurrences there are, and therefore we would understand that the likelihood is very high. So this area that I shaded in blue would be interpreted as high probability. 
And then if we have values occurring here in the tails, notice again the frequency is low. And so this would indicate that there is low probability, low probability. So again, if we are administering a treatment to a sample, they receive the, the antidepressant drug. And if their average amount of uh, de episodes of depression fall in the tails, in other words, have very, it's a very unlikely mean or average number of um, episodes of depression after treatment, we would understand that that's unlikely in the untreated population and therefore we have support um, that, that indicates that the drug was effective. However, if the sample mean of those who receive the drug is in the blue area, in the common area, then we don't necessarily have support for a research hypothesis that said that the drug was effective um, in terms of depression. So that's what we're moving into is if we administer a treatment to the sample, is the sample result likely to occur in the untreated population um, or is it unlikely? So is it likely or unlikely? And that will help us draw conclusions um, in relation to the population in terms of the independent variable we're testing. In this case, it would be the drug, the antidepressant drug. So let's talk about the definition of probability. So I began the, the lecture with this idea that most of us interpret probability as the chance of something occur, occurring. And we understand that there are several different outcomes um, possible. The probability of any specific outcome is a fraction, right, a part or proportion of all the possible outcomes. So again, I had written fraction to be equivalent to the part of the whole, right? And so we can use this equation as an interpretation of that. So probability of A. A just stands for whatever um, event we're interested in. So um, the probability of selecting a female from a list of names of this class, the probability of selecting a psych major from the students in this class. So the probability would be determined by the number of outcomes classified as A, number of females, number of psych majors, over the total number of possible outcomes, the total number of students in this class. So again, if I want to find out the probability of selecting a psych major from this class, it would be the number of outcomes classified as A, meaning the number of psych majors I have in this class, let's say it's 20, over the total number of um, possible outcomes. Let's say I have 40 students. So here again, the part of the whole. What part of this class is made up of psych students? There are 20 out of a total of 40 individuals. And we can also um, understand this not only as a fraction, but when it comes to probability, most likely we're going to see a decimal, the proportion of psych majors in relation to the entire class, or the percentage of psych majors in relation to the entire percentage of students in the class. So we would understand this is 1 over 2, or we could understand it as a decimal of 0.5 or 50%. So 50% of the students in this class are identified as psych majors. What some of you may notice is that this equation that we're using is very similar to something we discussed in Chapter 2, relative frequency. So relative frequency was frequency over n. How often something occurred over the number of times it could have occurred. And it's the same thing as probability. Frequency, identifying the frequency of psych and, um, majors over the total population, 40 representing the total number of students. So they're equivalent to one another. So relative frequency and the equation for probability are synonymous, and sometimes I'll use them um, interchangeably. So we need to recognize that there is specific notation when we are um, working with probability. So P is the symbol for the pro for probability. 
probability of some specific outcome is specified by P, and then in parentheses, the event. So notice how he had written probability of psych majors. Right. What is the probability that I would randomly select a psych major from this, um, from this course? So the probability of drawing, here's an example. So the probability of drawing a red ace from a standard deck of playing cards could be symbolized as the probability of the event that we're interested in is red ace. So probabilities are always proportions. We arrive at that proportion by first calculating the fraction, the part of the whole, the number of the event um, that we're interested in over the total probability that represents a population <clears throat> of um, individuals that we're working with. So here, we're, we want to find out what's the probability of selecting a red ace from a normal standard deck of playing cards. So we know that there are two red aces in any standard deck of playing cards, and we know that the entire deck consists of 52 cards. So again, this is the part, and this is the whole. And again, that's representative of a fraction. To, um, to, to express that as a decimal, we would take 2 divided by 52, and we get a proportion of 0 0.03846. So 0 0.034, excuse me, 0 0.03846 is the proportion of a standard deck of playing cards that's represented by a red ace. And again, this is um, the reflection of a proportion. In most cases, we are um, less comfortable with proportions, which is why we normally express things as a percentage. But just recognize probability can be, um, is most often appropriately expressed as a proportion, but we often convert as a percentage to um, convey more understanding um, for the general population. And this is a good point to um, stress rounding rules. So if I were to round to the, let's say, hundredths place, um, or let's say the thousandths place, so I'm going to write my final answer, three digits right of the decimal. So in that case, I'm going to take into consideration this value and then determine what I'm going to do with this value in terms of rounding. So if I'm going to round to the um, third decimal, right of the uh, third digit, excuse me, right of the decimal, then I would conclude that 4 is less than 5, and so then I could write 0 0.038 as my final answer if we apply ran, um, standard rounding rules. And if I want to express it as a percentage, I'd multiply that by 100, and I would get the same equivalent as, as if I were to move this decimal one, two places. So I would say 3.8% of a standard deck of playing cards is representative of a red ace, or there's a 3.8% chance that if I randomly selected a card from a standard deck of playing cards, that card would be a red ace. There's only a 3.8% chance that that would occur. And that's what we mean by probability, the part over the whole, the, the chances of selecting a, a specific item out of an entire group in which it, it exists. Independent random sampling. For the preceding definition of probability to be accurate, going back to the definition that was presented two slides ago, it is necessary that the outcomes be obtained by a process referred to as random sampling. So random sampling um, relates to a process or procedure used to draw samples. Required for our definition of probability to be accurate, so we must engage in random sampling for this definition of probability probability to be accurate. So again, the definition that was presented two slides ago is only accurate or applicable when we engage in random sampling. And the 
term independent um, or the independent modifier is genuinely left off. So in some textbooks you will see this process referred to as independent, independent random sampling, but in most cases we've adopted the phrase just simply random sampling. So again, the definition of um, probability that was presented was um, the following. So again, going back a couple slides, the probability of any specific outcome is a fraction or proportion of all possible outcomes. And again, here's the notation. Probability of event A is equal to the number of outcomes classified as A over the total number of possible outcomes. So I wanted to review that with you before we go on so that we understand this idea of random sampling better. So the definition of random sample. A sample procedure um, produced, excuse me, by a process that assures these two following things. Each individual in the population has an equal, equal chance of being selected. The probability of being selected stays constant from one selection to the next when more than one individual is selected. So in other words, if I were to um, state that I'm going to take a sample of 10 in individuals, um, that I'm going to select 10 individuals randomly I, in order for random sample procedures to be applicable I would have to ensure that each individual has an equal chance of being selected and additionally that the um, selection right, is constant. In other words, the denominator of that probability um, equation will remain the same after each selection. So going back to that example of the probability, probability of selecting a psych major. And we said that um, there were 20 psych majors and 40 total students. And so let's say I'm going to take um, create a sample of 10 individuals. And my first um, selection, my first student that I randomly select is a criminal justice major. Okay, so if I did not adhere to these requirements of random, random sampling, then after my first selection, the probability of a psych major being selected after one selection has been made would still be 20 and then over 39. Now that's inaccurate if I'm utilizing the process of random sampling. And why is it inaccurate? Well, the requirements are that each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So this person who is a criminal justice major has been set aside and that's denoted by the decrease in the denominator, the total number of individuals in the class. And if I've decreased the denominator from 40 to 39, I'm not adhering to this requirement, which states that the probability of being selected stays constant from one selection to the next. So when I select my second individual, now the probability of selecting a psych major has been altered because the denominator had, has decreased and that individual who was selected the first time and set aside is not capable of being selected again. So this idea of random sampling can be summarized by the process of sampling with replacement. If we sample and replace any selection back into the, the pool, then we are adhering to random sampling procedures. So again, if my first selection was a criminal justice major, and I notate that, um, then I, if I put that person back into the mix, then the probability of selecting a psych major would be 20 over 40, meaning that this denominator remains constant. So sampling with replacement will enable you to adhere to the two requirements of random sampling, which again are each individual has an equal chance of being selected and the probability of of being selected stays constant from one selection to the next when more than one individual is selected. So again, this idea of, of staying constant is applicable to the denominator of our probability equation. 
probability and frequency distributions. Probability usually involves population of scores that can be displayed in a frequency distribution graph. Different proportions of the graph represent portions of the population. Proportions and probabilities are equivalent. Proportions and probabilities are equivalent, meaning that the proportion is going to be a decimal and the probability can be expressed as a fraction, right, of the whole or as a percentage of the whole. Uh, a particular proportion of the graph corresponds to a particular probability in the population. So let's go through an example of this using a frequency distribution um, histogram. So in this distribution, we have um, x values. Again, the frequency, each box represents a frequency of how often this x value or score occurred. So in this case, we have a score of 1 occurring twice, a score of 4 occurring three times. And for this particular figure, figure 6.2, the question um, of interest is, what is the probability of x values greater than 4? So what is the probability that um, the, uh, there are individuals that scored higher than 4? So in order to calculate this, we need to figure out um, how many scores are above 4. So we have these shaded scores of 5 and 6. So there are two scores that are above um, this score of 4. And now we need to know how many total scores um, are there in this distribution. So that's just the, the total frequency that's denoted here in our histogram. So each box, again, is a frequency. So we just count up how many frequencies we have and that is equal to 10. So two-tenths of this distribution is reflected by scores above 4. And again, that's the fraction, the part of the whole. So the scores above 4 equal 2 over the total number of scores of, uh, equal to 10. So that's equivalent to a proportion of 0 0.20 and also equal to 20%. So 20% of this distribution of scores occurred a, above a score of 4. So again, this is the score of interest, the cutoff point of 4, and we want to know what's, what's the number, or excuse me, proportion of scores above that score, and we identified these two scores. So again, we see the probability statement, the probability of x values above 4 is equal to the number of scores above 2, which are equal to 2, over the total number of scores of 10, produces a proportion of 0.2 and can be expressed as a percentage of 20%. So 20% of this distribution of scores occur above the score of 4. So here's a quick learning check for this part of um, Chapter 6, which is Part 1. I think I neglected to state that at the beginning of this lecture video. And um, our first learning check question is a deck of 52 cards contains 12 royalty cards. If you randomly select a card from the deck, what is the probability of obtaining a royalty card? So the probability of obtaining a royalty card is equal to the number of royalty cards that we have, 12, over the total number of cards in the deck, which is equal to 52. So we see that this would be our response, and again, we recognize that that could be expressed as a proportion. 12 divided by 52 gives us 0.23, or 23%. So 23% of the a regular deck of cards is um, considered to be made up of royalty cards, or 0.23 is the proportion of a normal deck that is represented by royalty cards, or there is a 23% chance that if I randomly select a card from a normal deck of 52 cards, that card will be a royalty card. So all of those things are synonymous with one another, um, and they express the exact same thing. The probability, the proportion of a population um, that is, is um, described by a certain characteristic um, or the percentage of that population. All of those things are equivalent to one another. And finally, true or false. Um, choosing random individuals who walk yields a random sample. 
Is this true or false? Does this adhere to the requirements of random sampling or sampling with replacement? Well, that requires that in each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected. And additionally, that the probability of being selected stays constant from one selection to the next when more than one individual is selected. That's the definition of random sampling or this idea of sampling with replacement. So our first question is, is everyone in the population capable of walking? And the answer would be no. So if that's the case, then this choosing um, random individuals who walk yields a random sample. That would be false because of this reality that the population isn't made up of all individuals that can walk. So we would not adhere to the first requirement that says each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected. Next, um, true or false, probability predicts what kind of population is likely to be obtained. So probability predicts what kind of population is likely to be obtained. Well, if we think about inferential statistics, again, that's the process of using a sample to draw conclusions about a population. So probability doesn't help us understand or, or probability doesn't predict what kind of population is likely to obtain. Um, on the contrary, what we're looking at is using um, samples right, to draw conclusions about a, po a population. So probability predicts what kind of population is likely uh, to obtain. That would be false. And <clears throat> what we are actually doing is the population is given and the probability predicts what kind of sample is likely. Um, so again, the, the purpose or function of probability in relation to inferential statistics is as follows. We use probability to make predictions about the likelihood of certain sample averages that we obtain. And so it's not the reverse. We're not uh, making predictions. Probability predicts what kind of population. No, that's not the case. What we are um, um, engaging in is determining or making predictions of what kind of samples are likely. And again, going back to our normal distribution, if we think about frequency, the areas in the center, right, if we're taking the random sample from a population, that would have very high likelihood. And the areas in the tails would have very low likelihood of occurring, likelihood equivalent to this idea of probability of occurring. So again, what we are understanding is that the population is given, probability predicts what a sample is likely to be like, or the chances of that sample occurring um, in the untreated population. All of this will be um, discussed in more detail as we move through Chapter 6, but also very um, relevant to what is introduced in Chapter 7 when we discuss um, the distribution of sample means.